Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Underserved, the podcast for the rest of the tech industry. I'm your host, Andrew Jelina. With me in studio today is Lisa Maxwell, a manager in the engineering PMO at Curriculum Associates. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for making the trek from the Great White North. Oh, you're very welcome. It was nice to actually come back down into Massachusetts. It's novel to see people. Yes, it is. <laughs> Tell me a bit about what got you interested in technology back in the day. Well, I didn't fall into it immediately when I was younger. My mother actually recommended it because I really enjoyed math. But at the time, I didn't think it was something I wanted to do. And my passion was for music. So I followed my passion in college. And when I got out of school, I was pretty much qualified to do nothing. So I realized I had to kind of regroup. I had a bunch of office type jobs. And one of them, I had to learn how to use a PC and a word processor. And I started playing on there and writing some Edlin code, which dates me, and writing some macros for them. And just realized one day after I'd been hunched over my computer for four hours, focused totally on it, how much I really enjoyed it. And so I decided that I should go back to school to learn how to be a programmer. You got in that flow state where there was like lost time? Absolutely. Okay. So you go back to school to become a programmer. Is it like a degree thing or are you like, you know what? I think I could do this faster. Back in that time, I already had a bachelor's. I talked to some folks in the industry. I talked to recruiters. I said, what do I need to do? Should I go back and get a degree? And they said, no, you have one. Just get a trade school where they'll teach you how to do programming. And that should be enough. And it was. I got a job right after school. And what languages are you working with then? Uh, again, to date me, IBM Assembly Code mm -hmm. and COBOL and CICS. And a little JCL thrown in there too? Yes. Once I got into my first role, that was more of where I learned JCL. Not my favorite thing. So you hit your first job. What's that like? I loved it. I had worked all of these crazy jobs in restaurants and retail and then just being a temp in an office. And I couldn't believe how much they were paying me to have fun. Yeah, it's definitely an eye-opener. A lot of folks get drawn to tech for that reason, but then realize, hey, I really have an aptitude for this stuff. I'm good at it. I like it. What did you think in your first job? What did you gravitate towards? I really enjoyed more of the front end, the user interface stuff, as my mother called it, gooey. She loved that word, even though she didn't understand it wasn't really a word. So the CICS portion of it initially was what I really enjoyed. And you were also doing some testing there as well, right? Not in my first job. After working with COBOL and CICS for a while, I saw that things were changing and I was looking to learn new ways of coding. And so I was able to get a job where they taught me Unix and some Java and JavaScript. But because it was all new to me, they hired me as a developer, but said that for the first six months, I had to actually be a tester so that I would learn that way. So you do a manual testing or? Yes. Okay. Writing test cases, executing them, bug reports, the whole nine. All of that. That'll make you intimately familiar with the system. That was their goal. And it definitely was a good way to go about it. But, you know, definitely being a tester and being a programmer are completely different mindsets. You need to go into something as a programmer thinking about how can I make this work? You need to go into it as a tester thinking, how can I break it? Yeah. And. For one person to do both can be tough. You just get the blind spots when you're the developer. You want that happy path. That's right. So were you doing any other roles there as well, like along the software development life cycle? So for the first 10 years or so of my career in programming, I wrote code. And then I sort of fell into being a lead, which also morphed into being a project manager. And when I was working at Liberty Mutual, they actually put me through a pretty rigorous project management training program. And at that time, I was actually working in EDI and we were using Unix kind of to wrap around the EDI program that we used at the time. So I was both designing and writing that, but also I was project managing the three or four different vendors that all needed to use the ultimate EDI transactions that we were building. So getting them all on the same page and to agree on the format was a new challenge for me. 
Definitely. I remember the days of EDI. For folks who haven't heard of it, it's electronic data interchange, kind of precursor to XML when companies wanted to ship data back and forth to one another. Very popular. Very tedious, though, to like get everything right. Yes. And also, I even attended some of the X12 meetings where they were designing new transactions. Transaction could be like an invoice or a bill of lading or any document that used to be on paper. Now, if you were a Unix person back in the day, do you have a favorite shell? Born shell, K shell, C shell? Probably C shell. Yeah, I did a lot of C shell work too. Now a lot more bash these days. Or actually, I don't even know what the shell is on Mac, but that's where I end up dropping into most of the time. I'm not familiar with that at all. So I haven't looked at Unix in quite a while. Could you still quit your way out of VI if you had to? I know how to find out how. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. So you got into project management. What did you like managing people more than bytes? So after writing code for about 10 years, even though I changed languages here and there, I found like I was always solving the same problems over and over and I wasn't as challenged. And for me, I discovered that working with people, managing people, understanding how each person worked and being able to negotiate and get them to get their work done was definitely a big challenge, and I enjoy it. It's definitely a mind shift for most technologists to move from something that you have complete control over and can expect outcomes. Folks can walk, talk, and change their mind. Project management, all of the responsibility and none of the authority. <laughs> Amen. So were you doing some mentoring as well to folks or kind of managing dependencies? What was your role then? Well, I had the project management role in a couple of different companies, but at one point I was also a development manager. I actually built a, a large team from nothing. I was asked to create a team to do sustaining engineering, basically maintenance. And in that case, I was more mentoring people from the development and QA perspective. I had both on this team. Now, back in the day when I was doing more hands-on development, it was always tough to get the engineers to come do sustaining. What was that like? Absolutely. So that's where my negotiation skills and my persuasion skills came into play, trying to find ways to convince them to leave the R&D team and come join the maintenance team. I would try to suss out where they were in their career, what they enjoyed, and suggest things like, well, you could be the team lead. This would give you an opportunity to grow. Or we could put you on a different team where you can learn some new things. So it was definitely challenging. And ultimately, we did build a pretty good team size. Were all the folks here or did you have some folks remote or around the world? That was a global team. At that point, I was working in Cambridge, mm. and we also had people in Atlanta and Denver and London. We also had a big group of folks in India that were contractors, and the model back then, I don't know if it's still done this way, was we'd have a third of them come and work with us on-site and two-thirds work off-site. And then I also had a small team of developers in Beijing. So it was really interesting trying to have meetings with all of these different people. And as it turned out in that role, I would have meetings at like seven in the morning with India and at 830 at night with China. And then in between was my regular day job. Wow. Yeah, it can be tough to manage that much of a time zone difference with different teams. So sometimes it's an asset, like if you can ship stuff at the end of the day and say, all right, test this and or fix things. And you come in in the morning and things are better than you left them. But yeah, that's hard to coordinate. And we did do some of that. But because we were supporting a global customer base, we needed to have that. And so was it after that that you decided to leave tech for a while? Well, decided isn't exactly the word I would use. <laughs> um, this was right around 9-11. I was at Lucent Technologies in this role as development manager. And after 9-11, we had kind of the, you know, the I think both technology and just dot coms, all kinds of things were just downsizing. Yes. Mm. And as manager, I started getting invited to meetings where I had to start trying to save my people and ultimately had to start cutting. And one day I found out that they were having another one of those discussion meetings and I hadn't been invited. So I saw the writing on the wall there. And that was the first time I'd ever been laid off. 
it happened to be six weeks before my wedding oh. and a year after I had just bought a new home. But it was nice to be able to go off and enjoy our honeymoon without <laughs> having any stress of having to get back for work. But when I got back, I really tried to find a similar role, kind of a middle management engineering role, and there were just none to be had. And so I had to take a hard look at my experience and my background, my training, and try to recreate myself. And so I tried a couple of different things. And one of the things that I realized was that when I had bought my home, I had done it without the help of a realtor, and I had really enjoyed the process. It was very project management-like. You know, I came up with all of my lists of criteria. I would do all the research on all the homes before we'd go, and I'd have this whole schedule of which ones we were going to look at when all the things I had to have and not have. And anyway, I negotiated and purchased the home through the selling agent, and I thought, you know, I could really help people do this. And I think I'd enjoy it. So I talked to that agent and she said, oh, Lisa, you did such an amazing job on your transaction. We would hire you right away. So I took the classes, I took the exam and I got my salesperson's license. And that was right in this general area here in Massachusetts. And I did that full time for about five years. And it was a lot of fun when I started in 2004. Then around 2008... (laughs) It became less fun. Yeah, my timing hasn't always been good. (laughs) It started to turn into a, I'm really helping people. I'm helping them get out of properties before they foreclose on them or doing short sales or helping them understand some of the really bad loans that they had gotten into. And it wasn't fun anymore. And I was looking for something else. And the stars aligned because one day an email came into my inbox from a good friend who knew me well. And she said, you need to answer this ad. They're looking for you. Well, she worked in the nonprofit sector. And so she had seen this post looking for an executive director for a nonprofit music program. And I had my music degree and background in music and I had some business skills. And so I reached out and I applied. I went through a pretty rigorous interview process with the 12-member board of directors and was hired. Definitely didn't pay nearly as much as what I had been making in tech, but I was doing it for the love of music and education. And I was a one-person shop. Turned out I had a part-time office manager who was fairly young but very willing to help wherever possible. But I had to do everything from managing all of the hiring, firing, finances, grant writing, scheduling all of the events, um, creating the newsletter, as well as creating all of the programs for all of the concerts, and just basically being a cat herder to a lot of people. We had about 200 students in the program. I loved it, but I was working about 80 hours a week. And getting paid for about 20. (laughs) And are these like ensembles that would play concerts and... Yes, it was for children pretty much from age 5 through 18. The younger groups were mostly string programs where they would be in small groups. And we'd also sometimes bring in coaches to do some chamber music as a special addition to the program. And then there were two orchestras kind of for the older children, but they were based on ability and all required the students to audition. And so what was the audition process like? It was, it was grueling because there were so many students and of course everybody wants to be in in this group, but it was also for the younger kids a way to place them in the proper level. We had them come in and play for a number of the conductors, like a jury, and they would have to perform a solo, maybe do some sight reading, some scales It's very much similar to the all-state auditions that they do, which I've also actually been an adjudicator for in New Hampshire. So kids come in, they're auditioning, they're trying to make that top ensemble or whatever. What's it like delivering a message of you didn't make it to them and or their parents? It's so much easier to tell a vice president that you're not going to have this technology thing ready by tomorrow than it is to tell parents that their kids didn't make it into the program. I can imagine. My wife was involved with town soccer for quite a while. I helped her run some tryouts, including what was probably the fairest tryout in town history, 
where, you know, she was super scientific about having different evaluators and no one that was related to you was an evaluator and they dropped the high and the low score and averaged everything. I helped her do the spreadsheet for it and coaches had to take the top six and then they could pick amongst the next six out of 24 or whatever and super fair, but people were absolutely livid still. You know, my kid wasn't on this team and why didn't Junior make this? And oh, it was brutal. And how many years did she actually do that for? <sighs> that might have been the last year of participating <laughs> when she had to run the tryouts. She was the vice president of Youth Soccer Association mm. for a few years. But yeah, it was just tough being in that position. I almost feel like the parents internalize it, like you're rejecting them as well as the kid. Actually, we could put your kid up another team, but then they're going to stick out like a sore thumb and not play well. Like this is where they belong. That's right. They're probably not being very realistic about it because they want their child to shine and be the best at everything. And who doesn't want their kid to be the best? But, right. you know, sometimes like, eh, well, this is really where they're at. Right. And they're not going to have fun if you push them too hard. It's just going to make them want to not do it at all. I've seen that too, where the kid does get pushed up to a level that they're not ready for. And usually within a year, they're like, I don't think I want to play anymore. So funny, Andrew, that made me think of what it's like in technology when somebody's doing an amazing job as a individual contributor and the way that they get rewarded is to be promoted into a management position. That has never made sense to me because the skill set is completely different. And there are very few companies that I've seen and the ones that I've worked at that actually support them in that transition and teach them how to be a manager instead of being a sole contributor. Yeah, some companies will have what we'll call a technology fellow path where you can keep rising in compensation and authority while remaining technical. But most, you hit a certain ceiling where you must move into management if you want to continue rising in compensation and position within the company. And I agree that a lot of times they're thrust into it without much training in what is, as you said, a completely different skill set. It is. I'm not sure how we ever resolve that, but I always was supportive of that path of staying there as a sole contributor if that was their strength. But then there are people like me who discovered they really enjoyed switching over. So, Hey, sport. How was school today? It was okay, Dad. How was work? Ugh. Actually, I had a rough day. Leading an engineering team is hard. I mean, I have to ship new software, meet deadlines, and tackle new projects while keeping my team focused on the day-to-day. -day. It's hard to keep up. Jeepers, Dad. <laughs> Why don't you call Syrinx? They're the software engineering firm run by software developers. They helped Billy's dad. He used to be stressed out like you. He was missing deadlines, his team was overworked, and a bunch of folks left the company because it was too stressful. But then he called Syrinx. And they put developers to work right away. He hit all his deadlines and freed up his team to do other work. His boss was so happy Billy's dad got some extra time off. Time off? Wow. What did he do with that? He spent it with Billy. Aww. That's a swell idea, son. I'll call Syrinx today. Now, you go wash up for supper. So after being an executive director here for a while, you decide maybe technology might pull me back. What'd you do then? That's right. So by then it was probably around 2010-ish and there'd been enough time gone by. Things were turning around. So I actually worked with a career coach to help me update my resume and again, look at all of the skills I was bringing to the table so that I could make that jump back in after being out for a while. And so the way that I started back in was I actually took a role as a business analyst slash QA. And it was more on the business side than on the technology side, but we were still testing that the product changes. And from there, at the same company, I met some folks who were doing project management and I talked to them and asked, hey, are you hiring a project manager? And moved back into that. And it was at that job that I discovered the next thing that really changed my life, and that was Agile. 
I had always been a waterfall person. And my boss, who was the program manager, started talking about all these different new concepts. And one of them was Agile. And he sent me for training. And I got my CSM certified Scrum Master. And I never looked back. It just made so much more sense to me to be iterative in short bursts, to be able to get feedback and to be collaborative and have that cross team focus. And it just seemed more humane and just made sense. So I got a role as a scrum master and senior scrum master. And I kept taking training and I took some more training as an agile coach, ended up working as an agile coach actually back at Liberty Mutual, which I had worked at many years before as a software engineer and where they trained me to be a project manager. And eventually I met up with some of your folks here who had helped me with one of those senior scrum master roles. And then they told me about this position at this company I had not heard of before, Curriculum Associates. And they were looking for somebody who had both project management and scrum master experience. And so what have you been up to at CA? So I've been there now a little over two and a half years. And I was in that role for about a year, year and a half. And I have had an opportunity to move away from the project management and get more fully back into the agile side of things and was asked to start building a team of scrum masters, although we refer to them as agile leads at CA. And the team's been growing and Now that people are seeing the value in having a dedicated Agile lead, everybody wants one. And it's been a great experience. And I get to do some Agile coaching on the side. So I'm mentoring people, which I love. I'm working in the Agile space, which I love. And honestly, Curriculum is the best company I've ever worked at. Along the way, while evangelizing and getting folks to get on the agile train, have you either had challenges with management who want X features for X dollars in X time or with developers who may have been more entrenched in a waterfall mindset? So when I was working in another company as a senior scrum master before I came to CA, they still had kind of a dual scrum master leading the team and project manager leading the project concept. Mm-hmm. And I, I butted heads with the project manager quite a few times because my role as a scrum master was to protect my team from outside, you know, anything that was going to stop them from being able to do the work that they needed to do and that they'd committed to do. And the project manager would go around me directly to people on the team and ask them to stop what they were doing and work on something else. So. We didn't quite come to blows, but there was one point where he came to a stand up and basically announced that we didn't need to do retrospectives anymore. They were a waste of time and we were just going to keep doing the work. And he hadn't discussed this with me in advance. And I didn't say anything during the meeting. But at the end, I said, can we talk after the meeting and stood kind of toe to toe with this fellow who was towering over me and just said, the stand up is not your meeting. It wasn't your place to make that decision. It's the team's decision how they're going to roll with Agile and don't ever do that again. Good for you. Yeah, a lot of folks will kind of interrupt the process, kind of like CPU thrashing, right? You're just context switching over and over. Do this, wait, no, do this, wait, no, do this. And yeah, a Scrum and Agile approach is not going to work if you're constantly pulling people off task. That is so true. And managers, you asked about, I find that it's a similar situation to what we discussed earlier, where managers need coaching in Agile, a better understanding often of what their role is in an Agile workplace, because it's hard for a manager who's come up as a kind of command and control manager to understand that they need to let that go, empower their teams to take ownership of the work that ultimately that's going to make it so much more successful. And when the team owns it and cares about it, they're going to make it happen. But if the manager keeps getting in their way, it's the same kind of a problem as a project manager. So we need more training on helping managers learn how to step up and be more strategic in their roles. Because an idea, it's almost like an organ. Either everyone's into it and they accept it or they reject it and it's just pushed away. Now. 
you have been involved for quite some time as a member of Mensa, the International High IQ Society. Can you tell us how did you get involved and what's it been like? So when I was in college, I was getting the Reader's Digest. My grandmother had sent me a subscription and it was fun. And one day I was reading it and there was this just a brief article about Mensa and a very short test of logic type questions. And it said, if you can get this number of questions or more right within this time frame or less, you may qualify. So I took the test mostly because I enjoy those kinds of things. And I did much better than they had said you had to. And I said, really? Okay. Nobody ever told me what my IQ was. At that point, I was 20. If I had had an IQ test, I wasn't aware of it. Nobody had ever really shared that with me. So I thought, ah. Let me just go take their test and find out what my IQ score is. I'm not going to get into this, but let me take the test. So I sat for a proctored exam where they gave two different tests over the course of three hours. And a couple of weeks later, I got a letter in the mail that said, you have been accepted. To be accepted as a member of Mensa, you have to score in the top two percentile on any number of standardized tests. So it's not a raw score. It's the percentile ranking for each type of test and the scores can vary. And I was, first of all, I was shocked, (laughs) but I thought, okay, I'll have to join and just find out what this is all about. And I joined when I was still in college. I went to one meeting, but I was still in school. I had all my friends, all my studies. I was kind of busy. When I finished school and got out, I started going to meetings and I met people from all walks of life, all ages that were all welcoming, that we could sit there and just talk about anything. You know, one of the things that we all say is, well, they get my jokes, which are probably not often very good jokes, but they get them. It was like peeling away layers and just diving right in like I'd known them forever. You could be yourself there. Totally. And so are there meetings, get togethers, regional, national? How does it work? So it was first formed, I believe it was in 1946 in England. And then it came over to America. And we have American Mensa, which covers the entire country. There are 10 regions. And within each region, there are multiple local chapters, local groups. And so I become a member of your local group, but you're also a member of the national organization. And you can also get some information from an international organization. And there are Mensa's all over the world and more forming all the time. I ended up getting involved. And as you know, I fell into this project management and leadership type roles, which I enjoy. So I found myself volunteering at the local level to be on the board for the local level and then the regional level. And ultimately, I was elected to be the secretary of the board for American Mensa. Oh, wow. That must have taken up some time. It did. It did. Luckily, I had honed my typing skills over the years, (laughs) both in coding and then in that and having to type all the minutes. You must have met some interesting and unusual folks along the way. Absolutely. So first I'll say I've made some of my best, closest friends in Mensa, and I've been a member for quite a while. (laughs) But there are also definitely people who are on the spectrum, who are on the edges that I was barely 98th percentile. There are actually organizations for 99 or 99.9. And so you meet some very interesting people who you think, okay, they must be extremely good at this one or two things that they know about. But you also scratch your head and wonder how they even tie their shoes because they don't seem to have a grounding. Being that smart seems like both a blessing and a curse. You can be so wrapped up in something and you have such a concentration for it that you shut out so many other things, sometimes to your detriment. That must be it. I think one of the things that Mensa offers folks that are qualified is that social grounding. And that's one of the things I love about it and have learned to be more tolerant of some of those odder people that I come across. It gives them a place to belong as well. Hmm. So what do you do at the meeting? Are they regular? Is it like monthly or? I've always gotten questions over the years. Do you go and like talk about nuclear physics? I mean, what do you do? And we 
as an organization, hold no beliefs. We don't support anything, although we do have a foundation arm that supports gifted programs, which is amazing and would be the thing that I'd love to get involved in in the future. But what we do at meetings is anything. We have a lot of, well, most of the groups I've been a member of are here in the Northeast. And so a lot of the people I've met, believe it or not, are actually technology folks. There's a lot of programmers that are members. And there's a lot of crossover in my life, a lot of musicians, but there are also a lot of gamers. Gaming is a really big thing in Mensa. And by that, I mean mostly board games and not the ones you grew up playing with your parents when you were six, but just all the various board games. So not Candyland. <laughs> no, but one of the annual events that Mensa hosts is called Mind Games, where board game creators can submit their games and then Mensa sign up for like a four day, just go to a hotel and just play games around the clock, testing them out and rating them. And at the end of the weekend, they pick the mind game winners for the year. And those game companies get to put that seal on their game. And oh, that's cool. Win win. Now, I believe you played French horn and percussion and have been involved in playing with Mensa folks and in other places. Can you tell us about any memorable experiences on the concert train? Sure. So when I went back to school for programming, my thought was I need to have a decent job so that it'll pay for me to continue my passion in music. And I've actually continued to play music my entire life in all sorts of ways. My instruments in school were French horn and percussion. Uh, that's what I studied in college. And so over the years, I've played everything from classical to rock and roll. I've played in a German umpa band wearing later, later hosen. <laughs> and I've played a lot of musical theater, which is something I really, really enjoy. I played in cover bands in the 80s. And we did form an all Mensa band. And what we ended up deciding to do was for the 20th anniversary of the Sgt. Pepper album, we played the album cover to cover, front to back, just as it is on the album. And we rented out a hall and invited a bunch of people and we rented uniforms that looked like the ones they're wearing on the cover. And we just had a really great time doing that. Our keyboardist was a programmer and he was able to use sampling to create the string quartet that we needed for one of the pieces on the album. And there was one that had that Indian flavor. So I actually, as the drummer, got to sit on the floor and play the tabla for that. So that was really fun. That must have been fun for both Mensons and Beatles fans. Absolutely. Yep. Everybody really enjoyed that. Had a great time doing it. Any other memorable concerts that you played? I got to do something that was kind of a dream for me. I was a rock fan growing up, and The Who was one of my favorite bands. And I got hired in New Hampshire on the Seacoast to play a summer's run of Tommy by The Who, the musical. And that was basically me on French horn and a rock band. And the way that they had it set up on the stage was they built a platform 18 feet off the ground against the very back of the stage. And we would have to climb up a catwalk every night with our instruments. And we were sitting single file across the back of the stage behind a scrim so they could light us or not and play it up there. And basically, every time I played a note, it was a solo because you can't hide behind an orchestra. <laughs> you know, it's the only brass instrument there. So, but it was a lot of fun and terrifying because there was some really challenging parts in that. So you're playing these challenging parts in Tommy the Rock Opera, standing on top of an 18 foot high thing. Well, sitting, but yes. <laughs> right. Wow. That must have been cool. It was really cool. We did about 45 shows, so. Wow. Eight shows a week. Very cool. So Lisa, you've also done some teaching of music yourself, right? That's right. Although, honestly, I haven't gotten into that over all these years until very recently. Back when I was living in this area in Massachusetts, I was actually a volunteer for the Boston Symphony Orchestra. They have a whole organization of volunteers. And one of the things that I got to do was be the French horn. I guess I was showing the children how to play the French horn during instrument petting zoos. Hmm. They could come over to the BSO Symphony Hall 
and all the different instruments would be laid out with people showing how they worked and then letting the children try to play them. And so I did that for a number of years, really loved it. Trying to get every little kid, even like three-year-olds to buzz in the mouthpiece was like my own inner challenge. And when I moved to New Hampshire a, a couple of years ago, I was playing in a woodwind quintet. And one of the members of the quintet was a student at Concord Community Music School in New Hampshire. And she said, you know, my teacher, she plays the oboe, my teacher was wondering if you'd be able to help out. They're doing an instrument petting zoo and they don't have somebody to do French horn. And I said, sure, I'd love to do that. So I went and I did that in Concord. And that oboe teacher came and sat with me to see how I did it. And then later, another woman came in and sat down and said, show me how to do it. Well, it turned out she was the director of the school. And not long after that, they actually reached out to me and offered me a job to be the French horn teacher there. And I've been doing that now for about two and a half years. And it is unbelievably rewarding. I love it. I didn't think about doing something like this when I was younger, but now it's just at the end of a very long work day. I teach in the evening and I just get re-energized when I'm working with the students and watching them grow and have fun with it is just amazing. Well, that's awesome that it's come full circle and you're able to get kids excited about playing. It is. It really is. Well, Lisa, thank you very much for making the long trek down to appear on Underserved with us. And thank you, Andrew, for having me. And we'll talk to everyone soon on the next episode of Underserved.